In this video, we're going to finish our study of parametric curves and calculus. We will talk about finding the arc length of a curve given by a set of parametric equations. And we're going to talk about finding the surface area of a surface of revolution that can be found by taking a curve and revolving it around either the x-axis or the y-axis. And then we're also going to look at um, finding the equation of a tangent line. I forgot to do that at the end of the last video. Um, so actually, let's look at the, the problem from the last video and answer this question for that video. It's actually really simple. Um, you've already found, you've, you've spent a lot of time finding tangent lines um, back in Calculus 1. So this is just a review of that, that concept or that um, technique. So this is what we did earlier. Um, in the last video, <coughs> excuse me, we're given this set of parametric equations. We eliminated the parameter t to find an, a rectangular equation for the curve. We factored it, we used the fact that um, it was equal to zero at x equals negative two and x equals one to graph this. We know it's a parabola facing up because a is one and a is positive, the graph looks like this. and um, in earlier in the video, we found that the slope at this point was equal to negative one. So remember how we did that in the last video. We said the slope is just y prime over x prime, and those are derivatives with respect to t. y prime was 2t plus 5, x prime was 1, and then we evaluated this at a particular value of t. They asked us to evaluate this at t equals negative three. So we said, okay, let's substitute in negative three for t. And we just got negative one. And then we said, okay, let's visualize that so we can be sure we understand this. So we drew our curve. We figured out what location we would be at on the curve when t equals negative one. We did all of this work last time. We said when t, or excuse me, t equals negative three. When t is negative three, x is negative one, um, because we replace t with negative three and we solve for x. Do the same thing for y, solve for y, y happened to be negative two. And we said, okay, at t equals negative three, we're going to be at this location on our curve. And then we said the slope of that curve is this or the slope of the curve, excuse me, at that t value is the same as the slope of the curve at this x, y pair, x of negative three, y of negative three, which is negative one, negative two. So we're right there and the slope is negative one. And that's consistent with the picture. We can see if we try to draw our graph to scale, so if we go down one and over one, that is, um, it seems like the appropriate slope for the tangent line there. Now sometimes you do all of that and then they ask you for the equation of the tangent line. This is really just a calculus one review. <coughs> but now we're using um, parametric equations of curves. So if I want to find the equation of the tangent line at t naught, first I need to compute the slope. Oops. And you want to evaluate that slope at t equals t naught, and we already did that. So m is dy dx. In that example, evaluated at t equals uh, t naught, which is negative three, which happened to be negative one. And then we need to find the location that we, where we would be on the curve. So you need to find the x, y pair. So you need to find x of t naught, y of t naught. Think of x and y as representing location and t as possibly representing time, um, but just being an um, unpictured parameter on your curve. As t increases, that curve is traced out. So then we found 
x of negative 3, y of negative 3 by substituting t equals negative 3 into the parametric equations. And we got negative 1, negative 2. And if we want, we could call that x naught, y naught. Okay, so now I've got a point on the curve and I've got a slope. I just put those two pieces together. I use point slope form of the equation of a line. And then we'll solve for y to find the tangent line. Or I'm just going to call it the tangent. So I have y minus y naught equals m times x minus x naught. y naught is negative 2. m is negative 1. x naught is negative 1. So when I'm subtracting a negative, that makes it a positive 2. And when I'm subtracting a negative 1, that means I'm adding 1. Distribute the negative 1 and subtract 2 from both sides. Oops. So yet the equation of the tangent line is y equals negative x minus 3. And let's look at our graph. Is that consistent with our picture? Looks pretty good. Does it look like it has a slope of negative 1 and passes through the y-axis at negative 3? Pretty close. Pretty close. It's not a perfect graph, but it's, it's close enough that it tells us that our calculations for the tangent line and the slope and concavity and all of that are probably correct. Okay, so we just found the equation of the tangent line. Now let's think about finding the arc length. Now we found arc length before. You remember how we did it? Maybe we're interested in the length of the curve from x equals a to x equals b. Now we're going to say, start here at t equals a, at location x of a, y of a. And at time t equals b, stop computing the length. I just want the length from t equals a to t equals b then we'll be at x of b, y of b. <coughs> if this is the curve traced out by our parametric equations as t increases from t equals a to t equals b, and the curve doesn't cross itself at any point on the interval, so if that happened, we can't use this formula. Um, it, it's actually okay if it happens to meet, it's like start and stop at the same place, that'd be fine. It just can't sort of do this loop-to-loop -loop thing, and we don't want to go around the curve more than once. We only want to trace out that curve once if we want the length of the curve. Um, so let's say the curve doesn't cross itself. We're only tracing out the curve once. The question is, what's the length of this guy? What's the length of this curve? Well, I just, if I want to find it, remember what we did earlier in the section on applications of integration. We took this and we broke it up into a bunch of little pieces. And then we said, okay, if I want to find length of this whole curve, if that's possible, if I can find the length of one of these guys, if I can just find the length from there to there approximately. And then we said, hey, if I make these little um, segments small enough, that's almost linear, so close to linear that maybe I could say it's linear in the limit, the, uh, distance or the um, length of this curve is almost the same as the distance between this point and this point. Remember we said that this is x sub i, y sub i, and that this point is given by x sub i plus 1, y sub i plus 1. So i might be 4, so I might be going from x sub 4, y sub 4 to x sub 5, y sub 5, just for example. Um, I'm just finding the length of that, that little piece that goes from the fourth x value, x, y pair to the fifth x, y pair. Those subscripts are just labels for that. Do you remember how we did that? And that's pretty much what we're doing here. So when I'm finding arc length here, 
I say, let's take all of those little pieces. And let's find approximate the length of the ith piece by the Pythagorean theorem. Remember how this works. If this is x sub i plus or x sub i y sub i, and this is x sub i plus one y sub i plus one, and my curve looks like this. I can say that's approximately equal to the distance between those two points. So this, this is S sub I, but it, it's a, a, S sub I is approximately equal to that line, the, the length of that line segment. And the length of that line segment can be found using the distance formula. Or you could think of it as coming from the Pythagorean theorem. I'm gonna take the difference in the X values here and the difference in the Y values here Square them, add them, and take the square root to get the hypotenuse of this right triangle. So I'll have x sub i plus 1 minus x sub i squared plus y sub i plus 1 minus y sub i squared. This, this side squared plus this side squared equals that side squared. And then to get that side by itself, I take the square root and I get this. Well, that I can think of as a, a delta x sub i. And this I can think of as a delta y sub i. <coughs> so my x is changed by a little bit and my y is changed by a little bit. Remember earlier this semester we said, unfortunately, if I add these up, I'm not going to have that delta x or delta y that I need on the outside for this to be a definite integral. Um, so, so we needed to divide everything by x squared, and then we would write the integral in terms of x, or delta x squared. Um, or we divided everything by delta y, and then we could write the whole integral in terms of y. And this is a little different, though. Now, instead of x or y being the variable that ties everything together, the variable that ties everything together here now is t. So rather than dividing by delta x squared or delta y squared, we're going to do this instead. We're going to divide everything by delta t squared. And if I want to divide by delta t squared under the radical, that's fine, as long as I also multiply by delta t squared under the radical. And then I can simplify. I've got this plus this over this. And then that squared over that squared is that. And then we've got this over this is this. And the square root of delta t squared provided delta t is positive, and we can just, let's just pretend it is, assume it is, is this. So the arc length will be the integral from t equals a to t equals b of the square root of these guys in the limit, it's gonna be dx dt squared plus dy dt squared and we're integrating with respect to t. Or if you prefer, if you like prime notation, you can write that. Just remember that those primes are derivatives with respect to t. And we have this. So these are our formulas for arc length given um, parametric equations for the curve. And we have some qualifiers. This is um, if we have a smooth curve C. And we'll talk about what smooth um, means in just a minute. Given by x equals x of t and y equals y of t. We need C um, not to intersect itself. So we'll say where C does not intersect itself. On the interval from A to B, except possibly at the endpoints. It's okay to start and stop at the same place. 
then this is true. Now, um, a couple of comments. What does, it mean, what does it mean for a curve to be smooth? A curve like, that looks like that is smooth, has no sharp corners. And if you're saying to yourself, how on earth will I know that the graph has no sharp corners without seeing it? If I don't know what the graph looks like, do I have to graph every time? No, you don't have to graph every time. Um, a curve C will be smooth and it won't have any sharp corners as long as the following is true. The curve is smooth if X prime and Y prime are not simultaneously zero. If they're simultaneously zero, you might have a corner. Okay, so it said it was a smooth curve C and it does not intersect itself on the interval from A to B. So if a T equals A, we're at this location and then it looks like this, a T equals B, we're over here, we're not gonna get the right length of the curve. It's not allowed. But if it's nice and smooth and there's no X, Y on the interval from A to B, such that you get exactly the same location, X, Y, or there's no T value, excuse me, on the interval from A to B, such that you get the same location, X, Y, for two different values of T. Um, then you can use this formula to calculate the arc length of a curve. So let's look at an example. So let's say we've got X equals 6T squared and y equals uh, two t cubed, and we're on the interval from one to four. And we're asked to find the length of the curve on the interval. Well, there are a couple of things I need to check. I need to check and make sure my curve is smooth on this interval from one to four. Um, so I can't have any repetition of XY pairs on the interval. Um, so the curve can't cross itself, so I can't have any rep repetition of XY pairs on the interval. And X prime and Y prime are not allowed to be zero for a T value that lies between one and four. So let's compute X prime and Y prime and see what we get. Derivative of X is 12T. Derivative of Y it's two times the three is six. Multiply by t to the one less power. So I've got x prime and y prime there. They are simultaneously zero, but only at t equals zero. At t, if t is a number between one and four, this is not going to be zero. And if t is a number between one and four for y prime, this is not going to be zero. So we're fine there. Now if I want to see, or if I want to be sure that this curve doesn't intersect itself, I might want to find the rectangular equation of the curve and then graph it. So let's graph it just to see what's going on. Explore a little bit, see what this looks like. Well, in order to do that, I want to um, take this equation and solve it for x, or solve it for t, excuse me, or I can take this equation and solve it for t. Since this one has a t cubed and it wouldn't introduce that square root, I think I'll, I'll do this. I'll solve this one for t. So let's divide both sides by 2. And to get t by itself, we'll raise both sides to the 1 third power. 1 third times 3 is 1. So I've got t equals y over 2 to the 1 third. Okay. Now I'm going to replace t with this in the equation for x. So x was 6t squared. I'm replacing t with y over 2 to the 1 third. So you want to multiply those exponents. So this is going to be y over 2 to the 2 thirds.
And actually, I'd like to get y by itself because it'll be a little bit easier for me to graph it if y is by itself. So let's take this equation involving x and y, just setting this equal to this. And let's get y by itself. So we'll divide both sides by 6. So I have x over 6 equals y over 2 to this power. Raise both sides to the 3 halves power. Okay. Now I can take, if I've got a fraction raised to the 3 halves, that means I've got the numerator raised to the 3 halves over the denominator raised to the 3 halves. And something raised to the 1.5 power is that number, that something, times the square root of that something. So I've got 6 root 6 there. And on this side, because I raise both sides to this power, it's the reciprocal of this power, when I multiply those, I get a 1. So this is just a y over 2. And we'll multiply both sides by 2 to get y by itself. So 2 goes into 6 3 times. We have x to the 3 halves over 3 root 6. And if you want to, you can multiply by root 6 over root 6. So I have root 6 times x to the 3 halves. And in the denominator, I've got a 6 times 3, which is 18. OK. So this is y equals uh, this constant times x to the 3 halves. You're saying to yourself, what does that look like? believe it looks like this. Now let's think about what, where this is well defined. Can I put in any x value I want? Can x be negative? Well, let's look at this equation. If x is 6 times t squared, and t can be any real number, well, t squared will always be positive, or, or at least 0. Um, so x is uh, greater than or equal to zero. So we just get this <coughs> for our graph. And when t equals one, we're at x equals six, y equals two. This is not to scale. And at t equals four, let's see where we would be. Uh, four squared, that's 16. What's 16 times? 16 times 6. Is that 60 plus 36, 96? Okay. Not to scale. <laughs> and when uh, t equals 4, uh, y is uh, 4 cubed, which is 64. 64 times 2 is 128. This is very much not to scale. As t increases, we're going this way. Sorry about the little scribble there. But this is our curve. It's nice and smooth. It doesn't cross itself. We can find the length of the curve using our arc length formula. So everything checks out. So according to the arc length formula, We'll just take the integral from t equals a to t equals b of the square root of x prime squared plus y prime squared dt. And in our case, a is 1 and b is 4. And I just substitute in x prime and y prime. x prime is 12t y prime is 6t squared. We're hoping for some simplification so that we can evaluate this integral. We get 144t squared plus 36t to the fourth. I see simplification. Do you see it? Notice that we can factor out a 36 from both of these. You're saying, how did you know that that's divisible by 36? Well, 
Remember, I started with a 12. Um, so I can take out a 36. Since 6 is a factor of 12, uh, 36 to 6 squared has to be a factor of 12 squared. That's where I'm getting that. OK, so I do 144 divided by 36. Yep, that's 4, which makes sense because this is 6 times 2. But after I take out the 6 squared from this 12 squared, I should get 2 squared. I've got 4t squared plus t to the fourth. Oh, I forgot. There's something else I can factor out. I've got a t squared and a t to the fourth. I can factor out that t squared. If you're still saying to yourself, I don't know, I don't know how we're gonna do this. Don't forget your algebra. Your algebra is your friend. Makes it possible to actually solve the problems in that calculus book. If I've got a times b, and I'm taking the square root, you can take the square root of a and leave, or excuse me, um, well, that's not what I meant. I can take the uh, square root of a and multiply by the square root of b. I was thinking of an a squared, in fact, taking it out, but that's okay. This is the property I want. The square root of a product is the square root of the first factor times the square root of the second factor. And there's my first factor, and there's my second factor. So I'll get the square root of 36 t squared. Square root of 36 is 6. Square root of t squared is actually absolute value of t, but t is on the interval from 1 to 4. So t is positive, so I just get a t. That's cool. And I still have the square root of 4. Uh, plus t squared over there. And then I ask myself, is this a problem that I can solve using known methods? Do I have a basic rule for that? Well, no, I don't have a basic rule for that. What about u sub? Um, u sub will work. Now, if, if you're saying to yourself, why don't I have a basic rule for that? Um, I don't have a basic rule for this because I've got a product here. Um, and this is a product involving a function of t and a function of t. So we don't have any product rules in our basic rules. Um, but if I can write all of this in terms of u, and then I have a rule for that, I can use u substitution. So we are going to use u substitution. u is usually a function nested inside another function. I see this square root. I'm thinking what's inside is probably my u if a u sub is going to work. And then I say to myself also, um, is it going to work? I can find out by taking the derivative of u. Derivative of u is 2t. And then we multiply by dt to get du. And then I'm looking at this, and I'm really ignoring the 2. And I'm just focused on the t dt. And I say to myself, is there a t dt up here? There is. If there is a t dt, that explicit function of t times t, then I can write all of this in terms of u, and I can do the u sub. OK, now this actually has a 6t, and I've got a 2t. So in order to make this a 6, I'll multiply both sides by 3. So 6t dt happens to be 3 du. And I'm going, going to need some new bounds as well. So I, these are bounds for t. This is saying t starts at 1, and t goes to 4. When we write our integral in terms of u, we want to know where u starts and where u stops. So we replace t with 4 in our equation for u. We replace t with 1 in our equation for u. And we get an upper bound for u and a lower bound for u. This is 16 plus 4. That's 20. That's 4 plus 1, which is 5. So our integral can be rewritten in terms of u. Our new lower bound is 5. Our new upper bound is 20. This is a u under a radical. So that's a square root of u. And 6t dt is not du, it's 3 du. If you're saying, do I have a rule for that? No, I don't have a rule for that. You're right. But I can use exponent properties to rewrite it, and then I will have a rule for that. 
So we've got the integral from five to 20 of u to the one half power times three. And then we anti-differentiate using our basic rules. So we add one to the exponent, bring that three down, and then divide by the new exponent. Dividing by three halves is the same as multiplying by two thirds. Evaluate from five to 20. And so you've got two times 20 to the three halves minus five to the three halves. And remember what we talked about before, something to the three halves power is that something to the first times the something to the one half power because one plus one half is three halves. Or if you prefer, and I prefer this when I'm working with numbers, I've got x times the square root of x there. Anytime I see three halves, I'm thinking this. So this is 20 times the square root of 20 minus five times the square root of five. And square root of 20 can be simplified further. Remember that's four times five. Square root of four is two. Square root of five can't be done, so we leave it under the radical. So we've got 20 times two root five minus five root five. So we've got 40 root five minus five root five. 40 minus five is 35. So we've got 35 root five, and this is giving me 70 root five. We're saying, okay, what is that again? It's hard to remember. We were finding arc length. We're finding the length of the curve given by these two parametric equations on the interval from one to four. This is our very rough sketch. It looks like part of a parabola. It's not quite a parabola because it's not x squared. It's x to the 1.5 times a constant, but it looks like this. At t equals one, we start at x equals six, y equals two. At t equals four, we end up at x equals 96, y equals 128. And the length of that curve was found by evaluating this integral. Compute x prime and y prime, simplify, keep simplifying. Simplify until you get it to a point where you have a rule for that. Now we've got a rule for that. We do u sub, choose u, compute du, get the appropriate bounds. Write the integral in terms of u. Anti-differentiate, and then use the fundamental theorem to evaluate. Now this is 70 root five. So what is that? That's the length of the curve. It's about 156.5 units long. If you're saying, what kind of units? The same kind of units we have here. Whatever you're using for one unit for x and one unit for y, well, this is 156.5 of those units. That's how long this is, even though my picture is not to scale. If my picture were truly to scale, and I put a little piece of string on this, and then I took it out and measured it, I'd say, oh, it's 156.5 of those units, those you know, one unit base units that I started with. Okay, um, so that is it for that one. And the last um, topic in this section is the surface area of a surface of revolution. I think I'm gonna do that in the next video rather than this video.